Good afternoon, everyone, once again. Thank you for your presence. The participants are joining. We are going to have another webinar promoted by ANA in partnership with the U.S. Army Engineer Corps, long-time partnership focused on dam safeties and other aspects of water management. I would like to first give the floor to our regulation superintendent and safety dam safety who will introduce our webinar. Bruno, good afternoon. You have the floor. Good afternoon, Alan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bruno Rebolsa, superintendent for water services and dam safety at ANA. It's a pleasure to welcome you for another workshop uh, with the partnership of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's important to highlight this uh, agreement was signed in the end of 2021 and has as main focus capacity building and enhancement in the matters related to dam safety. As we know, USAP uh, is an expert in the theme and nothing better than hearing from their ex experience under their perspective. Our focus will be uh, hydrological principles for dam safety presented by engineer Michaela Mahoney. The moderation will be under our su uh, deputy superintendent for operation and critical events, Alan Weiss. Uh, for dam safety themes, what we look for is specialization of the institutional abilities of managing institutions, inspectors, inspections of dams in all states of federation. To reach this goal, we've done six seminars. I highlight the large number of subscriptions here showed not only the major interest for the theme, but also the relevance the workshops uh, sessions have had in the sense of training our manager managing colleagues and inspectors of the most diverse institutions. And I conclude thanking you and wishing you an excellent afternoon, productive afternoon. I thank you as us for the important, important partnership. And I highlight we want to train together, learn together and work together on uh, safety dam themes. With this, we'll have inspection institutions, implementers of policies and dam uh, owners that are specialized and always uh, focusing on dam safety. I pass the floor to Alan so he can introduce our speaker. Perfect, Bruno, thank you for the, your words. I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day, engineer Michaela Mahoney. Be very welcome once again. Michaela is a hydrologic engineer from the Risk Management Center of USAS, responsible for risk management with the portfolio, had set 740 dams, over 24,000 kilometers of dicks. She has over seven years of experience in risk assessment, uh, water risk assessment, dam safety studies to subsidize decision making based on risk and prioritize actions for risk reduction. She is all, also advises uh, teams and technical nas national technical groups in the United States to support efforts of risk assessment or risk anal analysis in the whole country. Ms. Mahoney has experience in water management and the operation of flood control for dams and reservoirs. She's master in civil engineering by Rice University and she's a professional engineer uh, of the state of Texas. Michaela, welcome once again. And I give the floor to you. The presentation is up on the screen. If anything, we just will interact through here. You have the floor, madam. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present my slides. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about the hydrologic principles uh, associated with dam safety studies. Um, and so here's a, just a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, go over the flood hazard analysis. 
uh, what, what's entailed in that, and then talk about hazard curves, probable maximum precipitation, and probable maximum floods, a little bit about flood forecasting and some future channel challenges that we might encounter. To get started, this is the, uh, equa the risk equation that the core uses. Uh, it, it includes the hazard, the performance, and the consequences if something fails. The last workshop was focused on how instrumentation can help understand how a structure will perform. And this workshop is focused on the hazards and how to calculate what the probability of a hazard might be. There are two main components of the flood hazard analysis, a flood hazard curve, which could include a volume frequency curve and a stage frequency curve, as well as the probable maximum flood. Um, and just an example of a risk estimate, here we see the annual probability of failure shown on the vertical axis and the average life loss due to the failure shown on the horizontal axis. And each of these box, blue boxes represent a potential failure mode, and the red lines represent the tolerable risk guidelines. The flood hazard is a key component of the risk estimate since the annual probability of failure is equal to the probability of the flood of the hazard times the probability of failure. Uh, this example uh, shows overtopping. Uh, of the embankment, which is influenced by the probable maximum flood, is shown that the is a function of mostly the probability of overtopping. Um, so that's that's how all both of these components uh, come together to calculate the and help with risk assessments. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, each of these components are developed and some things to look at. Uh, here is a um, hydrologic hazard curve, which is a probability distribution that is typically represented as a graph of reservoir elevation or stage on the vertical axis and the annual exceedance probability on the horizontal axis, which is, and this tells you the probability that a stage or reservoir elevation will be exceeded in a given year. Hydrologic hazard curves can also show peak flows or flood volumes versus annual exceedance probability. Generally for dam and levee safety, we are concerned more with this upper portion of the curve that is extrapolated beyond observed points um, to, to relatively small annual exceedance probabilities. Extreme storm rainfall data, historical flood data, along with hydrologic models and statistical analyses are very useful to estimate these curves through the full range and to understand and account for the uncertainty in the estimate. The uncertainty here on this graph is shown in the blue, the blue shaded region. Uh, it is important to note that the, the range that drives the risk uh, associated with a, um, the risk estimate for the dam is depend, depends on the, the failure mode associated with it. So for example, the, um, the region in the, the lower portion with the observed points in the, as the blue dots are typically driven by static failure modes. Um, and there's less uncertainty associated with those because there are observed points that can help tie the reservoir or stage to an annual exceedance probability. Above the observed points, typically above spillway crest, you have very limited observed data. So there's a lot more uncertainty in those estimates. And these, this area is driven mostly by hydrologic failure modes, such as overtopping. Uh, 
so to to develop a flood hazard curve or a hydrologic hazard curve, uh, there are two points, as I mentioned, the, the volume frequency or flow frequency curve and the stage frequency curve. Here is an example of the hydrologic hazard curve showing inflow volume, a duration versus annual exceedance probability. This data set includes a long gauge record shown as the blocks, black circles and his, large historical events and paleo flood events shown as the blue circles with flow ranges. Uh, this also includes precipitation frequency rainfall runoff results shown as the orange squares. This type of data is critical to extend the record in time from about 70 years of gauge record to about 800 years to reduce the bias and uncertainty in the extrapolations and those rare annual exceedance probabilities. When developing the, the flow frequency curve, it's really important to leverage that all of the available information um, like this example shows, including gauge records, historical floods, because it, it really decreases the uncertainty associated with those rare probabilities. Um, it's also important to, to use the current methods. Uh, currently, um, Bulletin 17C is used in the United States to estimate flow frequency curves. There are a couple of different softwares that the core uses, including RMC Best Fit, which uses a Bayesian approach to incorporate multiple sources of hydrologic information and expert elicitation to um, decrease the uncertainty and provide higher confidence in the results. There's also another software, HEC SSP, which can be used to calculate the flow frequency curves based on the 17 bulletin 17C methodology. When developing these curves, it's important that you don't anchor the probability of the PMF to define the curve. It's better to report the annual exceedance probability of the probable maximum flood discharge or volume from the curve. And it's, it's okay to have uncertainty in these curves. That we, it's okay to state that we don't know the exact value. And depending on the amount of data you have, you might have a relatively large amount of uncertainty uh, in the extrapolation above the observed points. And, and finally, it's when you're developing these, it's important to identify the key parameter. Is it the peak flow volume, typically associated more with levee systems, or is it the volume of water over a certain number of days, which is typically evaluated more for dams? The second part um, is the a, hydro, a stage frequency curve for reservoir um, pool. Um, this curve here was developed using a stochastic rainfall runoff model to include all of the available information and data in the watershed. To generate the stage frequency curve, these are routed, the inflows are routed through the lake to account for the storage and outflow conditions. The core uses a software called RMC RFA to develop stage frequency curves. And I'll discuss a little bit more about how these are, are done in, in the next slide. Um, the important thing here is to understand the physical characteristics of the reservoir and how it relates to the stage frequency curve. The shape here uh, is very dependent on the amount of storage that the reservoir has, any downstream controls for the, the reservoir operations, and uh, any overtopping flows associated with the reservoir. Again, like the volume frequency curve, it's important to leverage or use all available information, observe stages, or reconstructing historical events to better inform the lower portion of the curve. Uh, 
Um, and again, you don't want to anchor the annual exceedance probability of the probable maximum flood, but rather report the annual exceedance probability of the probable maximum flood. And again, um, embrace the uncertainty because we don't we don't know, and, and we want to understand. We want people to understand and that we don't fully understand the uh, annual exceedance probabilities of, of high reservoir pools. So the RMC RFA is a, a software developed by the RMC, which uses a flow inflow based Monte Carlo simulation, which uses random sampling to combine all of the important inputs for a reservoir, which include the reservoir stages, the starting pools, hydrographs, and the inflow volume frequency. And here, and incorporates and calculates the uncertainty of, of all of throughout the stage frequency curve. So this, this flow chart shows the process that RFA uses to calculate the uncertainty. There's an inner loop which estimates a stage um, every realization, every time it simulates, and then an outer loop that changes the parameters to, to calculate the, a new set of results, which uses and then combines all of that to create the full range of uncertainty. Um, some benefits to using this method to calculate uncertainty is that it doesn't provide a single point estimate and it, it allows the evaluation of various failure modes such as gate reliability or debris blockage. The current guidance in the US comes from a, um, a handful of federal agencies which have been refining their regulations and um, guidance over the past 20 years. Um, so these show the, the various documentations for developing hydrologic hazards or prob probabilistic flood hazards. There's a, a lot on this slide, but ultimately it shows the, the various methods of um, developing a, a, a volume frequency curve for various points and um, the lever, level of effort that it takes for to, to compute that and what you need for it. Um, the, also, like I mentioned, the RMC best fit and, RF, and RMC RFA and HEC SSP are all softwares that are used to help develop the stream flow um, frequency curves. And you, you also can um, look at other methods um, using more of a, a rainfall runoff approach that uses aerial average rainfall and precipitation frequency estimates that are routed through a rainfall runoff model to estimate the uh, stage frequency curves for a, a particular reservoir. In areas that have limited data available, it is beneficial to leverage the regional precipitation frequency analysis. And um, generally speaking, it's you gather your regional precipitation frequency depths, you look at observed hyetographs, the, the rainfall temporal pattern, you can scale those up to the precipitation depths, run them through a rainfall runoff model such, such as HEC, HMS, um, you can vary the loss rates to get some uncertain, some sensitivity to the to that to the curve, and then you route the inflows through the rainfall runoff model. And from those results, you can develop your stage frequency curve. So that that's what these three images are showing. Is the first picture 
um, shows the precipitation frequency results, uh, and then the uh, lots of runs and simulations of those rainfall depths um, routed through the rainfall runoff model give you a stage associated with the inflow volume. And then you can use the total probability theorem to, to generate your stage frequency curve. So the easing, using available data is, is the most important part in, in developing your flood hazard curve. The next part of the flood hazard analysis is the probable maximum flood, um, which starts with the probable maximum precipitation. Um, and that is the, um, defined as the greatest depth of precipitation for a given duration meteorologically possible for a design watershed or a given storm area at a particular location at a particular time of year with no consideration for, for change in the climate. And that, that is a definition by the, the World Meteorological Organization. In the US, the probable maximum precipitation estimates are based on hydrometeorological reports, which were developed for various geographic regions uh, as shown here. So you, you follow the methodology based on where the watershed is, is located for that particular region. Internationally, the World Meteorological Organization published a report um, shown here that outlines um, the process to develop uh, probable maximum precipitation estimates for any location. Uh, so the, they outline, the, this is the, the process that they outline. You want to take um, observed events that, uh, large observed events that um, are most likely the largest that you would see in that area. And then you can adjust them because uh, by moisture factors or other dew points, dew point temperatures or, or sea surface temperatures to find the, moist, the maximum moisture associated with that storm. Uh, after you find the maximum storm, you want to transpose it because it might not have occurred over the watershed of interest. And then, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so then you transpose it and, and you do this multiple times with lots of different storms and then you can create an envelope curve which establishes the largest value of precipitation for a given area and duration. And when you, after you maximize and you envelope all of the storms, you can find your, the maximum amount of precipitation for the watershed area for a given duration. So that's, that's the probable maximum precipitation. It's the depth of rainfall that you're expected to receive there are also some other considerations and parameters that needs to be uh, determined to create the probable maximum storm, which is used to create the probable maximum flood. Um, these include the spatial pattern, temporal pattern of, of the rainfall, storm area, where the storm is centered, and, and the orientation of the storm. There are some Ways, there are ways to do this. You can use prescribed patterns. You can use results from the precipitation frequency an analysis or observed historical events to help decide uh, these parameters. It's also important to consider the location of the watershed with respect to the orographic regions and the proximity to the coast because those will be uh, key factors in uh, development of, of the probable maximum storm. 
So the once you have your probable maximum storm, the flood is is what is expected from that rainfall and the most severe critical hydrologic conditions that are reasonable in a region. Um, so you have your, your, your probable maximum precipitation, and then you look at hydrologic condi conditions, um, which can be obtained from um, old design reports or other information associated with the watershed. Uh, you can also help, you can look at observed flow and precipitation data um, through a uh, hydrologic rain, rainfall runoff model. Developing the, the probable maximum flood is relatively straightforward. You have a rainfall runoff model. Um, typically, we at the core, we use HEC, HMS. Uh, where you can either, uh, you can initialize, you can find the initial parameters, and then if there's observed events, you can calibrate and validate that the model to those events. Uh, it's, the next step is to, to peak the unit hydrograph parameters, which accounts for the nonlinearity in the watershed response to very intense precipitation and this just is, is a more conservative approach um, because the calibrated model are, are, the model parameters are calibrated to a smaller precipitation event. Uh, then you find the most severe hydrologic conditions either through the calibration process or design documentation to route the flood through the model uh, and establish the, the reservoir elevation. Um, and then it's also important to, to provide, to run some sensitivity analyses to, to look at and find the most sensitive parameters to your probable maximum flood elevation or inflow volume. So the court, the court published a um, methodology document to help um, this process. We use a, a scalable approach um, with three main levels, we use a screening level, which can include a, if there's a model available or no model. And then as a conservative measure, we use, um, we determine a, a one, one and a half times the probable maximum flood inflow as an upper bound for us as a screening level process. And then each, each step is more detailed you start to evaluate the model, you look at calibration events and validation events um, with observed data. Um, and then you can also use, get as sophisticated as a, a two-dimensional hydrodynamic model such as HEC RAS. And, and that's what we classify, we use to classify the upper PMF, which is the very maximum <laughs> level of, of flood that could happen. Uh, so I mentioned sensitivities. Uh, this slide shows uh, some of the sensitivities that, that you can run. Um, we look at the probable maximum precipitation volume. You can look at the spatial temporal pattern of the probable maximum storm, any antecedent conditions. Um, so what, what, what is the watershed like prior to this event? You can vary the starting condition of the reservoir. You can look at different reservoir operations, loss rates, or transform parameters. So that's um, generally how, how we evaluate the probable maximum flood. And again, we, we use this to uh, evaluate overtopping of, of the embankment um, of, the, of the structure. Um, so just, just a little bit about flood forecasting. The, the core has established a water management system that automates and helps water managers um, evaluate and determine alternatives for um, 
operating reservoirs. Uh, so this is a, a real-time, so it, it gathers real-time information from uh, river gauges, flow volumes, you get the reservoir elevation, and that pulls in precipitation data. And then, then the operator can evaluate various alternatives of, res, of reservoir operations to determine the best um, course of action. Uh, so the HEC SWIMS, the CWMS, is core specific, but the RTS, the real-time sy system, um, is, is set up in a way that, that um, agencies outside of the core can, can use. So this, um, it's, a, it's a very useful system for water managers to, to use, and um, everything is contained within that system. Uh, you can also add in uh, um, inundation areas through this system and calculate any consequences of um, damages um, or, or breaches. So um, here, as I'm sure in Brazil, we're, we're facing um, some non-stationarity. So using past data to, to influence our current analysis isn't always, um, it's generally not the same things. Things are changing, such as land use, precipitation changes, and with the change in land use, you get a different rainfall runoff response. Um, so that those are a lot of things that we see um, associated with developing the hydrologic hazard curves is we have to account for those in, and how do we do that. Uh, the PMP estimates, the probable maximum precipitation, um, are also changing and, and because they're influenced by, by dew points and sea surface temperatures and, and those are not stationary also. Um, so currently uh, this for the core is more of a, a qualitative assessment of climate change and, and how this might impact future results. Uh, but there is a time series toolbox that was developed by um, the core to help evaluate that. And it's, it's a very helpful uh, website to, to explore data, to look at any trends, to detect non-stationarity. Um, so you can, you can either, you can put download or upload any um, time series data to this toolbox and, and have it, it'll perform metrics throughout this um, and within this toolbox. So you can see the time series and how the data changes. And then you can look at, uh, it'll run tests to determine um, any trends that were detected. So this this gauge in particular shows that there's a, a downward trend um, for all of the, the three statistical analysis that were conducted. So with that, you can say that while well, using the past data is not going to represent future data. Um, it, it also will run non-stationarity tests. And um, again, that shows that this data from older data is not the same as, as the current data. And it, it also does um, future projections of, of time series, series modeling. So it's, it's a very useful, uh, visually easy to understand what's happening with the data. Um, so to, to wrap up, those are the, the um, the main inputs to the hydrologic hazard analysis, um, which is the, the cornerstone, one of the cornerstones of a risk assessment. Uh, and it's it will, and it's important to use all of the available information that you have to better understand your current conditions and to evaluate potentially what could happen in the future. If uh, there are any questions? Two. The first question that we have, Michaela, 
It's from João Miguel. Actually, he's asking, we had in Brazil a very extraordinary event in the south uh, of this region that they really overcome more than 10,000 years of the forecast that we have. And he's asking if the tools and methodologies that we have presented here would be enough to forecast all the occurrences that we have in the south of Brazil, where we have a considerable accident there in the south. If you could yes. make any comment about this, please. Yes. You, you can definitely use all of this um, methodology to, to reevaluate those return periods and annual exceedance probabilities with the, the new data uh, involved with the, the big event. And, and having those big events is, is very helpful in defining or estimating the, the stage frequency curve or the annual exceedance probability of, of those return periods or those, sorry, those reservoir elevations. Perfect, thank you. Just to make it clear for you, João. All the dams were broken down because we have problems with it too much flow. So this methodology could be used for this to forecast, to predict if there is any future risk. And there is another set that Mi Michaela has shown here to predict the invasions to the right moment where we have this water flow, the right time. Another question that we have, Michaela, it's from Monica Milfont. She's asking if the statistical tests are done in the trend curves. In the final part of your presentation, you mentioned that. So she's asking if this test can be used, it can be done. If you could mention which statistic tests are used more commonly to evaluate the trend of this curve, that would be great. Do you use any kind of test to check if you have or not these curves? Yes, so the, the time series toolbox uses three um, statistical tests that a T test, a man Kindle, and a, a Spearman test to calculate trends, and it it'll print out the the results of of each of those tests. Uh, and then there's when you, if you want to look at non stationarity, there's uh, seven or eight different statistical tests that will tell you. And so shown here are the the number of um, all of the different tests and methods and um, which parameter was detected as being non-stationary. Thank you. And there is another question from Glaucus. How is the hydrologic ear determined? Um, in your case, I'm of not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, it is asking uh, how you determine the hydrologic year. How do you define hydrologic year? Is there a parameter or criteria to define what is a hydrologic year? Um. Are you talking about the uh, annual exceedance probability? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so the um, yes, the, the hydraulic year or annual exceedance probability is is based on the um, entire record of observed data as well as the stochastic simulations uh, from from the um, the model. So it, the model runs thousands and thousands of iterations to develop a, a very robust um, record. And then it uses uh, total probability theorem to, to calculate the annual exceedance probability. OK. 
Okay. Because I think, um, uh, Michaela, the question is about how you, if you, if you have a time series of hydrologic uh, stream flows, for example, and you have to pick up what is the maximum stream flow in each year, right? So how do you define in that, how do you separate the time series in different hydrologic years? I think that's... Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we, we use the, the water year, which is generally um, from October to September. Um, um, and so we pick for each year, you have the annual maximum flow or stage uh, between that period um, to, to define a, a year. And that's, right. that's based on um, generally the precipitation and the, the growing period is that um, the summer is usually less rain, uh, the winter has more rain. So you wanna make sure you capture, capture the, um, the peaks. But if, if that's different for different parts of Brazil, then it's, it's okay to use a, a calendar year, January to December, as long as it's consistent throughout the whole analysis. Thank you for your answer. And now we have another specific question now. The interpretation will, will be done, but what kind of techniques to predict? Do you make any differentiation about this? I didn't understand the question very well. So I think I want, to, I cannot translate it well. The question, Michaela, is what kind of techniques do you use for speedful forecasting? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, what kind of techniques do you use for stream flow forecasting? Um, so in the in in our system, we look at mm -hmm. uh, we use a hydrologic model which calculates the rainfall runoff, um, and to help and then uh, run that through reservoir operations to help predict and determine what the the flow would be. So it's a, a cent it's initially based on a hydrologic model um, run through a reservoir operations. We have uh, questions that are not from hydrology, but questions are about uh, uh, dam safety. And we already had this in a previous webinar. So I'm just asking people to focus on this webinar. The question is, could you please explain a little bit about the slide where you show the multiplication factor one and a half times the PMP or PMF, would that be in the absence of data to calibrate this model of the water flow or in any case as a, fa a safety factor due to the uncertainties in the studies or the entry data? I think 1,5 times was explained, but he doesn't remember the number of the slide. Yes, we so we use one and a half times the probable maximum flood to uh, incorporate um, any uncertainty and lack of conservatism in this very the screening level process because there's typically not a lot of data or information available to have a more concrete or more defendable answer. So we we use this to make sure that we are capturing the full range of potential risk due to the lack of data. Question from Octavio Vogel. He's asking, once you reveal the maximum flow, let's suppose that a study that to show all the superior flows and the amount of the project, the numbers of the projects, which procedures the regulation departments, American regulation departments, when they have this 
when the water flow doesn't have the capability to discharge the needs for new flows? This is a very important question. We have found this difficult here in Brazil to define the procedures that we have to use. There are lots of discussions about this specific point. So if you could mention a little bit how you are facing this kind of problem in the US. I don't know if it was clear during the translation. If not, I can try to translate for you. Yeah, so um, the, the question is how do we, how are we dealing with large uh, releases from dams during large events? No, actually, it's uh, how you deal with the situation where when you do a, a hazard risk assessment, and then you or uh, you, you need to revise your maximum flood because the maximum flow in our study is beyond the spillway capacity. So you just verify that the maximum flood is higher than your spillway capacity. So what is the procedure that your regulators or the users goes about uh, in that situation? Do you need to, you know, expand okay. your spillway capacity or you just live with that higher risk um, situation? That's that's the problem we have to do as well. Okay, okay, that makes sense. The um, so it. For us, it, it's very dependent on the fold risk equation. So we look at um, the, the hazard, the probability that the flood happens, um, the performance of the structure, if the structure is overtopped, what is the likelihood that it's going to fail? And then we also consider the consequences if it fails. So depending on where that lands, um, then we will take another step to look at to, to go further into um, um, better estimate what that might be, all of those those three components, and if we still think that the the confident the consequences and the probability of failure are high enough and above our tolerability levels, then we would go into a, a dam safety modification study and potentially. Um, we would do something, look at alternatives to modify the dam to decrease the risk to under our, to, to decrease it to our tolerability levels. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I think it was very clear. And we are not here in Brazil, we are still discussing what should be the procedure to go about in that situation. We have a figure. Uh, an instrument that's called the Dam Safety Revision that is done every five years or every 10 years. But then if there is a need to, you know, invest in expanding the fuel capacity, then the cost might be too high. And so there is a kind of a cost based analysis that needs to be evaluated in each case. But anyway, uh, uh, following uh, up to the next question, uh, Camila Azevedo is asking in English here, what analysis, what analysis criteria do you use to declare a flood that is in the watershed and not in the reservoir itself? So what, what classifies a flood in the watershed but not at the reservoir? Yes. Um, um, so there, there are times that, that the, there's a lot of, um, there's a flood in the watershed and it, and it affects various places or towns or communities, but it doesn't, um, reach the reservoir may be empty or, um, low enough, or we can discharge enough water from the reservoir that it doesn't result in a flood from uh in in that particular flood event so there there are times that the watershed will have um an extremely high the river will have an extremely flat high flow but it doesn't result in a flood um 
at the reservoir. And so that that is accounted for in the volume frequency curve, which is used to help inform the reservoir um, stage frequency curve. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And then uh, Ugo, uh, another question from Ugo, and he's coming back to the issue of non-stationarity. So he's asking how you verify the non-stationarity of a time series. I think you answered that before, but if you could, um, you know, explain that again. I think that's okay. the, so. The, the time series toolbox uh, looks at um, eight or nine different statistical tests that you can you can see on this slide, and um, each each one of these tests have their uh, they, it looks at the various different um, parameters within the uh, to try to detect any non-stationarity, and you can um, the, so the it's, to get a better understanding is the the more tests that show a non-stationarity for a particular parameter, the higher confidence that you have that there is a non-stationarity, a change in during that time frame. Okay. Hey, thank you. But then uh, just a follow up question. So, so if you do identify a non stationarity in the series, what, what do you do in, um, in terms of uh, the, the hydrologic flood analysis? Uh, is there a method that you guys are using to estimate a, a flood a maximum flood in a, in a non-stationary environment? Or... Yeah. So r right now it is um, a case by case and very subjective. Um, we are developing the next version of RMC Best Fit will be able to account for non-stationarity and engage uh, based on a, a particular time. And so when that gets implemented and developed, we will be using that um, on a regular basis to account for um, non-stationary. But right now it's it's very site specific. All right, thank you. And Paula Divino is asking, regarding the safety of dams and associated structures, which are the main parameters in hydrological analysis that should be carried out for helping to minimize incidences? Involved in the forecasting. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, which are the main parameters or hydrological analysis that should be carried out uh, to help to minimize the uncertainties involved in the forecasting? Um, um, in regards to flood forecasting, the um, it's watershed dependent. The, some watersheds are very sensitive to loss rates, others um, to transform parameters, how fast the water gets there. Um, it's also important to consider the, the antecedent condition of the watershed. Has it, is it very wet? Is there gonna be more runoff? Has it been dry prior to the event? Is there gonna be more infiltration? I think those are probably the main um, parameters to look at when uh, for flood forecasting. Right. And then if you, if you have a better calibration of those parameters, then, then it should minimize or reduce the uncertainty, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah, and, and the more the more data you have and the better that it refined that is, then you have a, um, an easier time to a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, when I was asking which would be the best and what would, what, what would be the criteria for you to decide between using PNP or an IDF curve? Uh, uh, we call the IDF the intensity duration frequency curve for rainfall. Um, so what, what would be the criteria for you to decide when to use the PNP or is that you know, an obligation or it's mandatory for for 
every hazard assessment in the US. I'm just explaining a little bit of question one out of me. We, we use the PMP for all of our risk assessments. We use the rainfall intensity curves to help inform the results of the stage frequency curve. So we can, we incorporate the precipitation frequency or the, um, into the, the stage frequency curve to help reduce our um, uncertainty, but we always use the PMP to define the PMF, the probable maximum flood. Right, so in most cases, you, you always go for the, the PMP, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So Glosser is asking, uh, in his studies that were performed by Dr. Mahoney, uh, it was possible to verify whether the existence of the PMP is conditioned to an existing of previous rainfall, or in each event, the rainfall is treated as uh, a random event. Um, what was that clear, Michael? No, sorry. Oh. Well, so she was asking if. Um, uh, in the studies that you have done, um, it was possible to verify uh, whether the the PMF has has happened actually before, <laughs> or it was just a event that was uh, studied for for that hazard analysis. What did you actually verify that the PMF, the the PMP that you just calculated, actually happened before or in your time series? We have not verified the, the PMF, but we have um, conducted paleo flood analyses that look back thousands of years to find evidence of a, a large flood. Um, and those have helped corroborate the um, probability or lack thereof probability of having a probable maximum flood. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I think maybe the question goes into the discussion that uh, when you calculate the, the PMP, the probable maximum precipitation, uh, that's always a precipitation that you have never seen, that you have never seen in your time series, oh. or in some cases, uh, you actually have recorded a PMP in your, in your record. So, uh, Gen generally speaking, yeah. generally speaking, the, the PMP yeah, has not be, yeah, <laughs> has not been seen um, because it's, um, yeah. you know, it's theoretically the maximum amount that could ever fall in one location. Um, we had a there was a hurricane in Texas in 2017 that came close to reaching a, a point value of of a probable maximum precipitation. Um, so in, in that case, and, and some of those cases, then we go back and look at other um, factors and um, parameters that go into the development of the PMP um, to, to see what it would be today with the change in, in climate. Nice. Yeah, yeah. In, in some of the cases here in Brazil, the, the PMP or the probable maximum flood is kind of compatible with the one in a 10,000 year flood. But that's not the case in everywhere, in every site. It's just a general perception. But in most cases, it's not a flood that has been reported in the past. Right. Um, and so moving on, there's another question related to, to climate change. So. Uh, beyond the question, the, the issue related to the non-stationarity uh, in the projects and in the designs of uh, hydraulic structures of dams in the United States um, or in the verification of that existing dams, uh, uh, is it considered, I mean, the, 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 the effects of climate change, are they ever considered in, 
in the projection of the PMP or the PMF? Are you guys considering climate change as a scenario uh, to, I mean, to calculate a PMP or a PMF for existing structures or for future structures? We do in a way that we, but we don't um, classify it. So we look at when we go to design a structure, we look at uh, a ten, uh, an increase in the PMP value of some percentage, or we do a site-specific PMP analysis um, to see any changes. And, and that's what we classify as the upper PMF. So, it, you know, and that's, and that's what we design to. So we're not quantitatively accounting for, for, for climate change and, and potential increases, but we are designing to a higher level than the PMF. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, there's just a couple questions and I will close um, the discussion with those ones. Um, the first one is from Tiago. Um, let me read that in Portuguese and then you can translate it in um, relação... With regards to, so, is it possible to enter data space in the specific basin with the HMS? So I don't know if. Your uh, rainfall runoff models results uh, that you presented in your presentation, you were all were they all simulated in HATCH, uh, HMS? Or did you use all the softwares? We typically use HEC, HMS for our rainfall runoff um, modeling. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then um, I, developing the, the stage frequency curve in RFA uh, uses just a simple um, storage equation to, okay. to calculate the elevation. Right. And then talking about the Hatch HMS, is it possible to uh, uh, use a specific rainfall uh, data set as, uh, as um, an input data for, for the model? I mean, if you calculate a PMF offline, can you just use that as an input data for the Hatch HMS simulations? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, as it, you need, um, you would need a, a a temporal component and then a, a depth, but you can you can definitely use use that. All right, and then that's how you come up with the probable maximum flood, right? Correct. By that changing us, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the final questions again about uh, climate change. If you if you ever consider any kind of parameter, um, like like a safe factor to um, uh, to make it larger, to make the floods larger, to consider uh, for climate change, is there a factor you use to to we, increase? We we don't use. We don't use a factor. Um, so at, at our screening level, at the the less intensive study, we'll use the the 1.5 times the PMF to try to capture that uncertainty and associated with cl changing climate. Um, as you get into a more detailed study, we start to use uh, more advanced modeling. Um, for we use a hydrodynamic model. Um, to account for the runoff, and we also use a, a site-specific analysis to determine the probable maximum precipitation. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's that's a big challenge for all of us. I mean, how to consider climate change in those hydrologic studies. There's um, there are those approaches that you just example to us there are inspiring maybe for many of us here in Brazil uh, but 
definitely we need to discuss more and you know um, elaborate on um, uh, the methodology that we need to use to include you know, yeah. factoring climate change and hydrologic studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's so, something that we're still um, working on too. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just want to thank you for the presentation and presentation, the webinar, answering all the questions, and just uh, want to pass the word to you so you can make your final comments. Great. Well, well, thank you very much for for having me and, and letting me present, and I hope it was uh, useful for everybody. Thank you very much, Gabriela. So I'd like to thank you all once again for being here at uh, the webinar. Thank you, Zassi. Gabriela, would you like to? Uh, thanks, Alan, for having us. And I really appreciate everybody's participation. And um, just we always get really good questions in these webinars. And I appreciate that very much. And thanks for Michaela for coming and presenting today. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you all for your presence. Yeah. Thank you, interpreters. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.